All right, folks. So unbeknownst to you, you have actually entered the second half of the financial uh, design financial professionals wearing pink section of the program. Thanks to uh, Sonali's uh, great intro there. Um, so we are going to talk about implementing product, product, product process change in a mature organization. That sounds thrilling, right? In fact, I'm actually going to change it up on you a little bit, and we're going to call it implementing product process change to mature your organization. See what I did there? Wanted to actually try to see if this is something that might make you stay awake a little bit coming out of lunch, considering uh, you know when you start to hear product and process and maturation of enterprises, you can start to get a little dreary. So I'm going to try to keep the energy up a little bit uh, before I really hit you with some boring tactics. I'm hopefully going to be kidding. So um, my name is Chris Avore. Um, I head up the design practice at Northwestern Mutual. It's about 120-ish person design team, uh, inclusive of content, uh, research, program management, and such. And prior to that, led up teams at Meta and NASDAQ, and then also uh, wrote a book a couple years ago on design leadership and management, and also the contributed to the Envision work, if you all remember them, um, around design maturity. And so the reason why I want to like bore you with this background is to say that I'm going to try to be ideally sharing thoughts and experiences and ideas and suggestions of a diverse span of employers, of practices, of domains, so that you're not hearing some dude walk up here and say, oh, he's gonna talk about process at Meta. Cool story, bro, we don't have 100,000 engineers. We don't have 100,000 product designers ready to just, at a two to one ratio, ready to just build, 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 right? Because that's definitely not how it is at Northwestern Mutual, I can assure you. So hopefully we'll see a little bit of where you work and how you work and some of the ideas that we're gonna be talking about today. So um, what I am curious to hear is if it could be, if we start to think about process, if I started to say to you, like imagine if you had more clarity in when you were undertaking a new project or imagine if your teams had greater awareness around what other possible useful work was already underway, perhaps by a bigger team or a smaller team elsewhere in that larger organization. Or what if your stakeholders or your partners had a better understanding of what was underway and what was going to be coming next? And then what if some of your design teams operated with more intentionality or they had a little bit better deliberate um, approach to what they were going to do and more importantly, why they were going to operate that way? And what if your product management team were actually connecting the impact of the work to larger goals instead of sometimes where we've seen folks being incentivized to just build, 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 right? And what if engineers felt like they could actually apply their product and business expertise earlier in the process instead of just that role that they don't like any more than designers like me like, any more than I'm sure product folks in the audience like when they say, oops, sorry, that's actually really hard. I probably could have told you that two, two months ago, maybe two weeks ago, if you would just let me know what you were thinking. And then what if we could do all of that at scale across teams, across multiple product portfolios and consistently over time? Right? Well, whose job is that? You know, that's not necessarily something that is going to be one person or one role or one type of uh, job for one person to execute. It's too hard. It's too much. And it requires too much buy-in. Right? So we're going to try to talk about is how to kind of like thread that needle, how we are going to be able to establish that partnership to get some actual change underway that, yes, will be extra steps that a lot of teams aren't doing today, but ideally will show material gains later on. It may not necessarily be immediately measurable, but it will be something that we'll absolutely be able to start to see better improvements in our relationships and in the work. And I pinky swear, folks, that a lot of the ideas I'm going to bring out are actually in practice in some of these roles. I also pinky swear I'm not going to try to use Gen AI as a catch-all savior at all times. And I also pinky swear that all of these materials will be available. So these slides do get wordy, that is intentional. It's not because I don't know how to search for stock photography, it's because, or, or no, like, and actually I do kind of suck at memes, like you'd probably see a lot of like Drake memes, or you've already seen the Spider-Man meme, you'd be like, bro, is this 2010? Come on, man, get some new material. Um, instead, I try to use language on these slides so that these slides are more useful to you three months from now, or six months from now. Or you could take it to your design leader, design partner, and say, hey, why aren't you doing this? so that that way they're a little bit more useful than if you did just have a bunch of funny memes um, on your, uh, in your deck. So 
what I want our operating hypothesis for the next like uh, 17 minutes and two one seconds is that by improving key moments of this product development life cycle with structured, consistent artifacts and activities, that our teams that we're leading will be operating more effectively and efficiently, not bad words, folks, um, and will create more opportunities for innovation, sustained growth, and ultimately increase enterprise value. So that does get some business stuff, right? That does start to get a little like, okay, this is where the, this is where the blazer comes in. All right, now, now I see where business guys are gonna start talking. Um, but bear with me. What I hope to talk through today is that we'll be examining that end-to-end -end products uh, life cycle. Not a whole lot new there, but we're gonna talk about where that breaks down. We're also gonna talk about what we could try to do intentionally, where we could create some degrees of tactical change that could possibly shift some of those pain points and flip them into opportunities. And then also how this, tr how this process change can actually unlock better impact throughout the, uh, throughout the product life cycle, but ultimately after launch as well. So first off, we're gonna talk about trusting the process. Um, you know, how might we be able to shift how we show up as leaders to enact change in that product development process? So the first thing we're gonna talk about is this elephant in the room when folks hear about process. I'm gonna share some quotes from a bunch of old white dudes that have been really successful at doing this and bashing process, starting with Jeff Bezos, right? The process can become the thing. The process is not the thing. It's always worth asking, do we own the process or does the process own us? Pretty sure a lot of folks have heard something similar to that before. This dude, Steve Jobs, it's not process, it's content. You know, that doesn't mean we don't have process, but that's not what it's about. Hard to agree with that, or hard to disagree with that, rather, right? Of course, there's going to be some degree of process, but let's not make that the thing. Ultimately, Reed Hastings says that the reason it's been, Netflix has been so successful is because it has a culture that values people over process. People over process, folks, it's, it sounds great, right? It's a great idiom. It sounds perfect. It makes you sound like you can just like trust your folks to never uh, work in some period or state of lack of alignment or with conflict, competing or conflicting incentives and everything works out just right. We're gonna hear that that's not always necessarily true, particularly at scale when you have multiple teams all trying to do that. And lastly, this, is, this one's a little bit more important. Where process is great when you live in a world where both the problem and solution are known. Now, in a lot of the work that we are doing today, and I mean we collectively, like all of you folks, not knowing what the heck you do, but having a pretty damn good idea that we are not necessarily just building widgets along the assembly line, a lot of the work that we do does have degrees of ambiguity. It does have degrees of complexity. It does have degrees of not knowing if what we are doing can be usability tested to value, right? That's, where, that's the sweet spot that we wanna start thinking about. And so when we think about this like, you know, the, the typical process that we'll, that we'll try to use today, I'm fine anchoring on the double diamond, right? A lot of us I'm sure are familiar with how this works going from the problem to better understanding it to then like now that you know what the problem is, that then you can proceed on through the solution. I definitely have beef with this. Peter Merholtz just recently uh, wrote an article that was kind of saying like, hey, in enterprise design, let's all agree that like, we know what we're gonna deliver, right? Like it's rare that we just say, I don't know what we should do. Maybe we should go try to figure something out. There's usually an intent when that project starts that sometimes makes um, seeing this model absolutely um, uh, accurate problematic. How many folks have seen the uh, infamous design squiggle of like trying to replicate what the product development process looks like or the design process? A lot of mess up front, trying to actually like get closer to certainty as that process evolves. Um, you know, we kind of go through that double diamond phase of where the messiness is supposed to be at the discover phase. And then by the time you're getting to deliver, there's a lot less ambiguity, there's a lot less chaos. Again, I could put my kids to sleep at night telling that nice bedtime story, right? Um, instead, it's usually like this, a lot more compressed and you still have a lot of that angst, a lot of that turmoil throughout the whole thing, right? Rarely is that straight line nearly so straight. And oftentimes where that kind of comes through is where there is a, what I call like a rudderless product development process where we are looking for certainty where there may be none or where we may not even necessarily have a point of view of what we are trying to do with this thing, where we don't necessarily know what questions to ask. We haven't even chronicled our assumptions that we're making when we're trying to start this work all the way through delivery, where we are overemphasizing deadlines, oftentimes by dates, where we don't necessarily know what's even like what the design team is going to be making or does the engineering team know what design is going to be producing. And 
not necessarily a culture of iteration where we're like, we only get one chance, right? And if you screw it up, then the funding goes away and now all of a sudden you've got a project and you go and shopping again. And the reason for a lot of that work is from a lot of these old white dudes um, where these folks were talking, and this is Adam Smith and uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor and um, Peter Deming. Is it Paul Deming? It's Deming, I know that part. Um, He's actually like a really, really accomplished uh, management writer that uh, someone just blanking on his name. What's that? In God We Trust. In God We Trust, exactly. There we go. Perfect. W. Edwards, w. Edwards Deming. All right, there we go. There we go. See, I, I like a good call and response. Keeps you, keeps you folks engaged instead of being like Homer in the, uh, in the pillows, right? I should, just, I should have just said, well, which one's Adam Smith, folks? You know, <laughs> go multiple choice. Um, but anyway, like these guys all uh, operated, obviously, decades if not centuries ago where work and labor were trying to identify as and maximize as much efficiency as possible, right? Where you were going to try to extricate as much unknown as possible throughout the work process. Um, and so if we were to think about how product development leaders today kind of anchor on some of those traits of the scientific method of assembly line product development, what we'd probably see is not Paul or Peter Deming, but W.F. Deming, uh, talking about fixed goals, right? That the specs must be heavily documented, where you're trying to explain everything. We'd be looking at fixed tasks, where we're gonna have rote methods every single time because come hell or high water, we are going to have wireframes in this project. We'd be talking about fixed deliverables that may not necessarily change when your work is underway, where you could absolutely learn something new tomorrow but because you wrote a plan a month ago, you've got to now craft some type of artifact to deliver that. And it's always emphasizing the predictable. We're gonna, this theme is going to come around a couple of times. <clears throat> um, and ultimately, the way we oftentimes try to look at measuring success here is things like, did the boss like it? Did it meet all the requirements? Did we hand it off on time? And personally, my favorite, did Dev have to make changes? No care if they actually built the right damn thing or not. It's like, did somebody actually have to go back and do more work at the job they're being paid to do? Um, Amy Edmondson of the Harvard Business School um, really called out this type of behavior and these types of expectations and these attitudes um, when she said that most managers have been either explicitly or implicitly trained to think in terms of accomplishing fixed goals, fixed tasks, and deliverables in this predictable world, right? And then she goes on to say that, you know, basically, we're not in that world anymore, folks. You know, we need to try to figure out how we can embrace process without over-indexing on that predictable mindset. And so if we started to think of, well, what type of framework could we apply here? That's when we look into like systems thinking. And this framework um, or these attributes are from the D school, disruption school of, uh, of design led by Dr. Leila Okoroglu, where she talks about interconnectedness, balancing isolation versus relationships in this new way of working. And we could kind of apply the same type of work to her. What if we had her as a product development leader? We could say, you know, emphasizing a clear vision and North Star would be more about that interconnectedness, right? Like, how are we not just having blinders on looking for one thing? All the way through, like, embracing emergence, learning something new that we did not expect, seeing when two things, when put together, are actually going to create something differently than we expected. How do we adapt to that, right? Ultimately, too, what we'll see, again, like, I don't need to get through all this. Ultimately, what we can do, though, is think of determining success by, does it create impact? Did it create positive business value? Did it create potentially user harm that was unexpected that now we have to immediately take action to, to prevent it going either even deeper or, or even wider, right? What do we need to know now that we didn't know? And where else can we be driving change? And so when we're thinking of that type of process, now we can start to see that, yes, it's still a process. Yes, this is still based on that a slightly problematic double diamond, but good enough for Tao, that what we can see here is that it's still possible, right? Even at that discover phase, we can still have clearly defined hypotheses. Or we can still be intentionally looking for a signal that will give us conviction to commit to going to the defined stage, right? All the way down to the deliver phase where we know why we're actually doing this, where we know with intentionality what is coming and why it's going to be useful and what we can do with it next. And then Folks already have an understanding of how it's going to be measured and what we're going to do with those measurements as it informs future product development. Um, what we'll also see here is that, you know, when we try to compare them side by side, it's really pretty stark, right? 
I don't need to drain this slide and just read everything to you. This is kind of what I meant, right? This is like why you want to uh, save these for later. But ideally, what we're seeing here is that for every problem with an ineffective process, there is still an opportunity that process unlocks that can still elevate that maturity. You can start behaving, acting, and embracing the behaviors of that more modern product development um, environment. Um, so if we wanted to kind of think about where we could change, we want to think about when you go back to work uh, tomorrow or Monday, you know, where are those moments of unpredictability that, that you have not been able to necessarily lean into? Where could those artifacts, where could possible artifacts give some um, moments of clarity of a shared point of view where you say, okay, now I get that, right? Now it makes a little bit more sense. Um, so let's get into part two now. This is where we're gonna talk about some of the things we can do, some of these artifacts. Um, so if we think of the discover phase as that very first step where we wanna talk about arriving at a hypothesis or perhaps starting to see if there's a there there with our, um, a problem worth solving, you know, first off, one of the better things to do is just establish role clarity, right? Who's gonna do what? Let's not get as focused as like a racy. We're just talking about like, what is the scope of research? What is the scope of design? How much is product going to shape this? And then trying to capture that in writing in a, in a pair of briefs, between a product brief and a design brief, we have found that this gives a lot more of that clarity up front sooner. Um, basically, what we have seen here is that by having product actually have to write down some of their intentions around like why this problem is worth solving, who it's going to be for, how we're going to measure success, is a great opportunity to apply some focus so that design can then have their own answer, right? Um, and the design brief in, uh, in my organization is oftentimes much longer than the product brief because the design brief is meant to ask a heck of a lot more questions. It's supposed to poke a lot of holes in that product brief where there are those assumptions or where there are those generalizations that designers are probably going to have to work through before they finally come through their uh, ideal solution. So in practice, What's been interesting seeing that is that the teams that hesitated taking those steps to actually write down what they were thinking generally had less conviction in their design decisions, folded when challenged to say like, well, why do we do it that way? And they oftentimes operated with less certainty in a lot of their work. They'd say, uh, we could do more, we could do more uh, explorations. We could decide to talk to more users, I guess, because they didn't have a firm foundation upon which they were standing. Likewise, by having product and design writing these together, we got a lot closer to actually seeing how this could benefit, right? There was a lot less ambiguity that created more meetings. When we think of defining these phases, right? We've tried to set up Figma boards where a lot of this work is all happening in context. This is super useful too, because what we're seeing here is that designers have this info front and center as do our product partners, as do our business stakeholders, as do engineers. And they're able to see the work starting to emerge instead of these big aha moments where you just say, oh yeah, and then this is why this is also helpful. And what we've seen with that is that we're also seeing that it's tying back, we're, in, we're ensuring continuity between those design briefs because a lot of that info is now repurposed there, but that's where you're doing the work, right? Likewise, the types of questions that product engineering and business stakeholders are asking are actually going to, advance that project more because they're not getting keyed on some of the things that wouldn't be as helpful, right? They understand the altitude and they understand the context appropriate for their question instead of just saying like, well, why is this blue or why is this over here? In that exploration phase, what we're looking for is that intentionality of not overly committing too soon to what we think we need to do, right? And so here, what I wanna show is basically how we are creating, again, keeping context in mind here, right? What is the current state? What are the solutions? And then what are the benefits of that work? Because again, what we're trying to show here is a dialogue practically of why it is what we're doing and then how we're actually delivering it, right? Instead of again, oh, here's a Figma link, go check it out, you know? Um, because that is where you start to get into a lot of ambiguity because people then don't have the focus or the direction around what to even say. They don't necessarily know what altitude they're operating at and they run the risk of commenting on the wrong thing and then designers are gonna be at risk of over-indexing on that inappropriate, not, not to slander it, but like inappropriate feedback that's not gonna be helpful. So in practice here, you know, 
trying to explicitly frame those problems and how the design work is actually solving that is going to help create a lot more of that clarity downstream. Likewise, again, kind of like I was just mentioning, it's going to create tighter coupling, or by tighter, more tightly coupling it, you're going to see better understanding across these teams without having to just create more meetings to get it done, right? So lastly, in the deliver phase, what we're going to see here is super simple, super simple. This is stuff that like surprises me that we haven't been doing this uh, in the design industry for a long time. And just even talking about like how we're delivering files, right? Um, we've actually tried to take this step at Northwestern Mutual around like deliberately trying to structure how our Figma files are all, are all delivered so that engineering and our product partners are again knowing what to expect, right? What we're seeing is that by just shaping this up, because we have a lot of design teams here, um, what we're seeing is that then designers are spending more time in Figma instead of more time organizing Figma. We're also seeing that we don't have to think about like, well, what should I name this? Or how should I do this? How should I do it this way for this team? And then lastly, we're also seeing that product and engine know where to look, right? When they come into those files, they don't have to kind of reorient themselves every time, especially if they just change teams. Now they're like, well, this one team did it this way. Now I don't know where the heck we're looking this time around. So left you a couple questions around what you could start to ask some of your teams to see if any of this kind of resonates with them, right? Um, when we think of change management, we don't want to create too much change at once and overwhelm your teams. We don't want to necessarily be trying to like solve everything in one day. That's oftentimes my risk, right? I have a strong bias to action, and I love trying to create this change. Um, but some of this, you have to take bite size and piecemeal and say, what could get us the most impact? But then sometimes it's also, what's going to get us a little bit of, what's going to be our first quick win, you know, without necessarily over, over indexing on just what can be. And then lastly, if your teams are absolutely stagnant, if your teams are absolutely comfortable, what you can do is create that sense of urgency by showing what's not possible. You know, you want that design system we heard uh, earlier today. We can't do it without because of this, this, and that reason. You want more of that? You want AI here? Well, our engineering team's gonna need a heck of a lot more to know about what we would be putting in those models, and we don't have that level of clarity yet, all right? Um, I think we're up about out of time, so I'm gonna cut it here. Um, we good? All right. Are we good? <laughs> All right. I mean, so much ground to cover there. We have Adam Smith, the double diamond, and change management. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, we... I bring, I bring the show, man. Yeah, no doubt. I, I don't think anybody was arguing that. <laughs> um, it, wonderfully academic, which, of course, we appreciate. Um, so apparently there are no unanswered questions, which makes me feel a little nervous. I kind of feel like they're... You're nervous. I'm here, buddy. My seat's nervous. I'm You're just a... No offense. I don't know if I... Yeah. Wow. Where to take that one? Well, I'm just kind of curious, like, <clears throat> of what you showed, what would you say would be, like, the, the, the biggest surprise to you before you went down the path that you went down and what you showed us? Uh, general chaos. The, the degree of chaos that some of these teams think of as normal, I think is, is... The general chaos. Well, not just in the world. There's plenty of chaos there, but actually in teams, like joining a, joining a new team or seeing how one team operates differently from another and the degree of chaos that is accepted as just going to work, I think never ceases to surprise me. Like there are times, like that is the benefit of working at a million and one places in my career is that I've kind of seen that some of this stuff can be a heck of a lot easier mm -hmm. and uh, folks are just used to it being hard. Yeah, I mean, I, I had to double click because general chaos kind of sounds vaguely specific and specifically vague there. Yeah, and I'm right there with you in terms of like patterns and trends that play out. I think what's, what's really interesting about your presentation is if I put it next to where we started with Richard Dalton, mm -hmm. right? Like we, we have the thought of scaling silos and many, many teams kind of operating, um, hopefully not 100% independent of one another. Right. But trying to, trying to go micro macro for that, it's, uh, well, I'm sure it's a challenge. Yeah, well, that's, and that's actually some of where these tactics have tried to address. Because like, when we talk about those design briefs, one of the things that they are so super useful for mm -hmm. is trying to see what other teams are doing. Because now we have some degree of 
format where we can say, is this, is this been solved before? Have we looked into this? Has another team tried this already? Mm -hmm. And then to look back at what they wrote and to say, all right, yeah, it looks like there's actually going to be some, something there that we should try to either reuse, adapt, learn from, take advantage of. Um, because when you have these different design teams, so again, it's not a problem at a five person startup, but once you start working on two different feature sets or two different users, that problem can start on a 10 person design team, let alone a 100 person design org that is supporting multiple business units, multiple functions and so on. Yeah. And in, in all clarity, no one on this stage, regardless of jacket color, is saying that a five-person startup doesn't have challenges or, or problems in and of itself. No, in, in I mean, in fact, like, that's where even like, starting to add a little bit of intentionality in that process can start to create a lot of you know, downstream wins that, again, people probably didn't even know were missing, mm. right? Like they're, they're saying, like, wait a minute if I just declared what the heck we want to do, if I just said like, what problem are we actually trying to solve or what our assumptions are with it, mm -hmm. when confronted with it downstream, you kind of have, have firmer ground you're standing on than if you're entirely surprised. Setting up, the, setting up the environment to be surprised is a heck of a lot more useful and a heck of a lot more of an opportunity than when you're just straight up surprised. When you're like, I wasn't expecting that. But if you create the ground or the conditions and your team is expecting, well, we don't know about this, so we're going to run an experiment. Or we're going to run a pilot and we're going to heavily check this. Or we're going to do a heck of a lot of like, observation and research. And then this is what we don't know what we're going to hear. Mm -hmm. then, you're, then you're starting to get away from that, that like, um, you know, what we were hearing about that expectation of predictability, right? which is where we don't want to go, which is what we don't want. Yeah, in a way, our jobs would be a, a little boring if we didn't have like changes and surprises on an ongoing basis. Do you feel like the creative brief helps with the, the bias toward action and kind of being proactive around those changes? Yeah, absolutely, because what it's setting you up for is what you know at that moment in time, right? And so it gives you something to look back on and say, well, was I right about this or is this you know, did I miss the broad side of the barn on that? And now I have to take additional steps to recalibrate and say, what do we have to do? So again, it's kind of helping you be more prepared for what you don't know is around the corner. Um, again, like when we think of predictability, we can have predictable methods mm -hmm. without predictable outcomes. Oftentimes where process gets kind of tarred is that it's thinking of predictable outcomes. You expect, you know, delivery this way, or you expect these types of results, you expect these types of metrics. That can get you into trouble real quick because that's when you start locking down innovation because you have to be safe. But when, you, when process actually means we are going to declare a hypothesis and then we're going to figure out ways to learn and then decide if we're actually on the right track, that's a heck of a lot different. Love it. One final question, yep. which is when it comes to a team that's been... Um, kind of like knowingly chaotic and has very little process, how do you, how do you enter in and, and introduce it? Like how do, you, how do you make sure that it has fertile ground? Yeah, so a couple things. We started to touch on it at the very end of, of uh, the talk there. You could decide what could have the greatest upside or what would have the least resistance, right? Um, the least resistance may be something like how you're gonna organize your Figma files because as, if you're a design leader and that's your problem, you can kind of mandate that. You can kind of say like, all right, design team, this is the way we're gonna do it, you know? Or you could say like, we're gonna have a workshop and we're gonna all come together and we're gonna figure this out collaboratively what the best way to do this is. But that's not going to require a heck of a lot of buy-in around how the Figma files are gonna be organized. But if that's not the problem, if you wanted to go to your product management team that has appeared to you, or perhaps you're in some type of like misleveled organization where the head of design is two levels down from the head of product, which definitely happens a lot, that's gonna be a tougher conversation to say, I want your folks to start actually writing down what, what they think is the problem and not just giving me features. You gotta have some social capital there in that org to have that conversation successfully. Um, because otherwise they're gonna be like, that's cute bro. You know? and, and they're gonna scoff and they're gonna say, things are working just fine. You just tell your designers to keep building what we're telling you to build. Yeah, I'm sure no one in the room or online is at all triggered by that whatsoever. Sorry. Chris, thank you so much. Great. It's been a real a pleasure. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.